All right, this is your lecture on Lady Lazarus by Sylvia Plath. Um, when you go to the pages uh, part where I've put up uh, people's readings of these poems, it is actually Sylvia Plath herself who is reading the poem. Uh, she wrote Lady Lazarus in 1962 during a creative burst of energy in the months before her death by suicide in 1963. This poem remains one of Plath's most enduring works. Lady Lazarus is both the title of the poem and its speaker. Much like the biblical Lazarus, the man Jesus resurrected from the dead in the Gospel of John, the speaker is also resurrected by external forces and more than once. This resurrection, however, is unwanted. The speaker reveals she wants to die in order to escape the profound suffering caused by living in an oppressive, male-dominated society. Instead, the speaker is forced to come back to life, each revival a carnival-like performance for a peanut-crunching crowd. However, the speaker warns her enemies, the men who bring her back to life. Eventually, she will return and eat men like air, demonstrating a complicated dynamic of empowerment and hopelessness. Using metaphors of death and resurrection, Plath provides a dark insight into the suicidal mind, as well as a critique of society's twisted fascination with suffering and of the horror of being a woman in a patriarchal world. All right, this is a modern translation of the poem. I have done it again. Once every ten years, I manage to kill myself and come back to life. I am a kind of living miracle with my skin so white it looks like a lampshade the Nazis made from the skin of dead Jewish Holocaust victims. My right foot heavy like a paperweight and my face, without its usual features, looking like a fine piece of Jewish cloth. Peel off the cloth, you, my enemy. Do I scare you without my nose, with my empty eye sockets, and a full set of teeth like a skull? The sour smell of decay on my breath will disappear in a day. Soon, very soon, the skin that decayed in my tomb will be back on my body, and I will come become a smiling woman again. I am only thirty years old. And like a cat, I also have nine times to die. I am currently dead, and this is the third time out of nine. What a shame to destroy each decade like this. See the million flashing bulbs. The crowd crunching on peanuts shoves in to watch as my burial cloth is unwrapped from me like some kind of strip tease. Gentlemen and ladies of the crowd, here are my hands, my knees. I may be, I may be nothing more than skin and bones, but regardless, I came back as the same identical woman I was before I died. The first time I died, I was ten years old. It was an accident. The second time I died was intentional. I meant for it to last and to never come back. I rocked into a ball, shutting myself off into the world like a seashell. People had to call and call for me to come back to life and had to pick off the worms which had already begun to infest my dying body as though they were pearls that were stuck to me. Like everything else, dying is an art form, a skill. I'm extremely good at it. I try to die so it feels terrible, like I'm in hell. I try to die in a way that feels as though I'm actually dying. I guess you could say that dying is my calling, since I'm so good at it. It's easy enough to die in a cell, like a mental hospital or prison. It's easy enough to die and stay in one place. It's the dramatic resurrection, the return in the middle of the day to the same place, the return to the same body, the return to the same old loud and surprised shout. It's a miracle. It really tires me out. I charge for people to look at my scars and I charge for them to listen to my heart. It beats fast and continuously. And there is a charge, a very expensive charge, 
for people to hear me speak or to touch me or to buy some of my blood or hair or clothes. So, sir, doctor, so, sir, enemy, I am your great artistic work. I am your valuable item, like a baby made out of pure gold that when dying melts until there is nothing but the sound of screaming. I turn away from you and burn alive. Don't think I underestimate, just don't know how concerned you are for me. Now I'm just ash, all ash. You poke at the ash, stir it around, looking for my flesh or bone, but there isn't anything left. Just a bar of soap, a wedding ring, a gold tooth filling. Sir God, Sir Lucifer, beware, beware. Out of the ashes I will rise, my hair red like a phoenix's feathers, and I will eat men like they are nothing, like I am simply breathing. All right, some of the themes of Lady Lazarus. Death and suicide. Throughout Lady Lazarus, the speaker uses extended metaphors of death and resurrection to express her own personal suffering. The speaker compares herself to Lazarus, a biblical reference to a man Jesus raised from the dead, telling the reader that she has died multiple times and is, in fact, dead when the poem begins. However, through external forces, the speaker is brought back to life time and time again. For Lazarus, his resurrection was a joyous event, and one might assume that all such resurrections would be happy. But the speaker of the poem subverts that expectation. She wants to die. And so the efforts of those who want to save her, whether loved ones or doctors or whoever else, feel to the speaker like selfish controlling acts committed against her wishes. Obviously, the speaker is not actually dead, but uses this metaphor to demonstrate how unbearable life is and in turn explain and perhaps justify her suicide attempts. Thus, the reader can interpret the poem as the musings of a suicidal mind, with death being alternately presented as freedom, escape from suffering, and the achievement of a sort of peace. Throughout the poem, the speaker often contrasts life and death by using imagery that subverts the reader's expectations. Note how the speaker describes life through disturbing images, such as comparing her skin to a Nazi lampshade, or describing her resurrection as flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me. This imagery is surprisingly applied to the speaker's living body after it is resurrected. The speaker describes her experience of living as a kind of torture, almost as a kind of death. When she is brought back to life, her skin is like the dead skin of someone killed in the Holocaust. It is the skin of a dead woman forced back onto her living self. Thus, the speaker demonstrates how living for her is what death feels like for most people. In contrast, the speaker describes death as a kind of calmness. For instance, when the speaker describes her second suicide attempt, the imagery evokes the peacefulness of the sea. The speaker tells the reader she rocked shut, alluding to the rhythmic, calming waves of the ocean, while the worms or maggots that invade a decaying corpse are depicted as pearls. The speaker also transforms into a seashell, shedding her skin to become a creature with a hard outer shell, implying that for her death, for her, death offers blissful solitude and protection. For the speaker, skin, which falls away in death, is a symbol that the speaker is still alive. When she is resurrected against her will, the flesh, the grave, cave eight, reappears on her. The speaker's disdain for her skin seems to stem in part from the fact that the skin both displays and is the receptacle of the pain and suffering of life. The speaker at one point mentions others, eyeing my scars, capturing both how skin is scarred by trauma, but also how skin displays that trauma for the world to see. In this way, the speaker's skin subjects her to what she believes is an intolerable invasion of privacy. Death offers protection from that invasion. When the speaker begins the poem, she reveals that she is currently dead, 
it can be assumed that she has tried to kill herself. She tells the reader she will be reborn as the woman she was. However, by the end of the poem, the speaker has transformed into a phoenix. Out of the ash I rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air. Although this is seemingly a moment of empowerment for the speaker, the turn also conveys the hopelessness the speaker feels about her situation. The phoenix, a mythological creature, is known for its regenerative abilities. Thus, like the speaker, the phoenix dies and is reborn. However, because the speaker has transformed into a phoenix at the end of the poem, this could signify that the speaker is stuck in a cycle of dying and being, be and being reborn that she can neither escape nor control. And this way, the speaker expresses the intolerability of her life. Though logically the reader understands that the speaker is not truly immortal, the speaker demonstrates that her life is so insufferable that it feels as though her life will continue indefinitely. Through the exhausting patterns of suicide and being saved and brought back to a life she does not want. This pattern in turn also explains why death is so desirable for the speaker, because she feels as though she cannot die and must suffer forever. Death is only solution to uh, is the only solution to end her suffering. This theme appears in the poem in lines 1 through 5, lines 10 through 19, lines 22 through 24, line 33, lines 35 through 56, line 69, <clears throat> excuse me, line 69 through 78, line 79, and lines 82 through 84. The next theme is gender and oppression. Lady Lazarus is told from the perspective of a woman in a male-dominated society, and the speaker directly blames her suffering on the men whom she sees as oppressing her. The poem strongly suggests that the men mentioned are the ones, whether loved ones or doctors, who keep bringing the speaker back to life, su suggesting how little autonomy women can ever hope to have in a patriarchal world. The poem's metaphors of death and resurrection, then, come to illustrate how society seeks to dominate women's lives and bodies. The implication is that one of the reasons that the speaker wants to die is because, ironically, it's the only way to exercise some semblance of control over her own life, which then makes the fact that she can't die all the more agonizing. Most often, the speaker's oppression takes the form of objectification. Society treats the speaker like an object whose purpose is to please others rather than a, than a complete human being. The speaker even goes so far as to compare herself to a Jewish person in Nazi-occupied Germany. She calls her skin a Nazi lampshade, her face a Jew linen. The former is a reference to an urban legend that Nazis made lampshades from the skin of Jewish people, murdered in the Holocaust, while this linen refers to the cloth used to wrap the biblical Lazarus in his tomb. Notice also that these are both domestic items, and as such are associated with typical conceptions of femininity. Although invoking the Holocaust is definitely macabre and controversial, this comparison is meant to indicate the extent of the oppression the speaker feels, the degree to which the speaker has come to feel she is seen as a thing rather than a person. Later, while addressing her enemies, the speaker declares, I am your valuable, the pure gold baby. This metaphor not only reduces the speaker to someone else's valuable item, like gold, but also infantilizes her by making this valuable object a baby. The fact that the speaker's body is so often seemingly put on display for others further suggests how women's bodies are never really their own, but instead used for the benefit and entertainment of other people. The speaker describes her suffering as being a spectacle for the peanut-crunching crowd, which is at once a condemnation of the macabre interest people take in others' pains, and more specifically, a commentary on how women's pain in, is particularly commodified. Note the sexualized language, like the unraveling of the death cloth, of the cloth covering her corpse to a strip tease. 
Altogether, it's clear the speaker doesn't feel like she really has much say regarding her own life. And in her mind, the culprit is the patriarchy. Throughout the poem, the female speaker expresses particular attention towards several men. The speaker frequently uses apostrophe, directly addressing various figures, God, Lucifer, Doctor, German for doctor, and a more general enemy. She calls them all Er, which is German for Sir, indicating that they are all men. And it's also worth noting that Plath's father was of German descent. These men all represent the different kinds of male authority figures in the speaker's life. Religious figures, doctors, or psychologists, her father, who all work to control her. But the fact that the men reference span from the prototypical, prototypical, prototypically good God all the way to the prototypical evil Lucifer suggests that these men can also be seen as more generally representing all men or the entire male-dominated society in which she lives. Ironically, the speaker's wish to die might then be interpreted as a desire to escape this world and its oppression. That is, perhaps, to the speaker, death represents a sort of freedom or reclamation of control over her own life and body. And yet, when she attempts to commit suicide, the speaker keeps being brought back to life. As such, the speaker warns that when she returns from death, she will eat men like air. The speaker intends to destroy the men who have forced her to stay alive, and thus will finally be able to die as she wants. The speaker must consume men, and perhaps with them their power over her, in order to finally do what she wants. Despite the tangible and almost frightening rage found in this revenge fantasy that ends the poem, though, it never quite pushes past being just a revenge fantasy, and thus seems ultimately not to promise an actual revolution, but instead a condemnation of the impossibility of women's liberation in a patriarchal world. Uh, this theme appears in the poem in lines 4 through 19, lines 25 through 34, lines 43 through 53, and lines 58 through 84. <clears throat> All right, the next theme is suffering and performance. The speaker sardonically declares that dying is an art like everything else and repeatedly presents her suffering as a performance for an audience that is eager to watch the show. To put it bluntly, the poem is deeply critical of society's twisted fascination with others' suffering. The speaker describes her death and resurrection as being theatrical and describes how the peanut-crunching crowd, you'd probably say popcorn-munching today, push and shove in order to get a glimpse of Lady Lazarus wrapped like a mummy in death, being resurrected. The big strip tease the speaker ironically calls this show, suggesting that people view pain and suffering in much the same way they do sexual gratification. It's all just fodder for their amusement. The speaker even charges audience uh, for access to her. There's a charge for the eyeing of my scars and for the hearing of my heart and even larger charges for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. Not only are people able to watch the speaker suffer, but they are also able to actively participate in her suffering. People's fascination with others' pain and lack of empathy seem, seemingly know no bounds. At the same time, the speaker herself does seem to find some sense of empowerment from this spectacle, complicating the notion of it as purely exploitative or degrading. The speaker clearly feels oppressed by a society that objectifies her, and in a way decides to use that objectification to her advantage by charging for access to her pain. The speaker in the lines immediately following addresses her enemies. So, Herr Doctor, so, Herr Enemy, I am your opus, I am your valuable. The use of the word opus here implies that the speaker's work or art of death and resurrection is not her work per se, but rather is the artistic work of her enemies. This makes sense. All the speaker wants to do is die. 
The spectable spectacle is created when she is continually forced to recover, to be resurrected, such that society can then look at and gossip about why she wanted to kill herself. The speaker suggests that the performance is being forced on her, that she is being forced to star in it. Of course, this isn't a real show. The speaker is using an extended metaphor to relate how much society craves sensationalism and gossip and to condemn those who would use others' pain for macabre entertainment. The performance could also be seen as a metaphor that represents the complicated dynamic between the artist and their art. The speaker describes the repetitiveness of the performance as exhausting, telling the reader that it's easy enough to die by herself, but it's the theatrical comeback to the same place, the same face, the same brute, amused shout, that truly knocks her out. Although the speaker's performance is both authentic to her experience and a way in which she can derive a sense of empowerment from her suffering, she is also wearied by having to repeat her suffering over and over. This could reflect the struggle many artists have when they represent their suffering in their work and come to believe that perhaps the performance of suffering is what makes their work popular or valuable to others not what they have to say about it. Uh, this theme appears in the poem in lines 25 through 34 and lines 51 through 65. All right, now we're going to talk about symbols. Um, the first one is skin. The speaker's skin, which is referenced several times throughout the poem, is a symbol for the speaker's life. The pain that is so much a part of that life and the way that her pain is both always on display to others and at the same time hidden. The speaker states that although she is dead, she knows that soon the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me and I a smiling woman. The speaker sees her skin as an indication of her status, living or dead. Because the speaker wants to die, though, the skin becomes a symbol of her suffering. She demonstrates this when she tells the reader her skin is bright as a Nazi lampshade. The controversial comparison illustrates the extent of the pain the speaker feels, which to her feels just as horrible as the pain the Jewish people felt during the Holocaust. This also demonstrates the horrors her body has suffered physically. The Nazi lampshade is a reference to the legend that Nazis used the skin from murdered Jewish prisoners to make lampshades. The speaker is suggesting that the cycles of death and resurrection she has experienced have put her body through a simil similar level of physical suffering. The skin is the outermost part of the body is the boundary between the speaker and the rest of the world, and as such is the location of both physical and emotional vulnerability. But the skin is also a kind of canvas upon which the curious world can gaze and speculate upon the speaker's actions. The speaker captures all of these aspects of skin when she says that she charges people for the eyeing of her scars. The scars indicate the speaker's physical suffering, the result of the trauma that the speaker's skin has suffered, perhaps by the speaker's own hand or by other unmentioned abuses. These scars can also be a metaphorical representation of the speaker's suffering, demonstrating that the speaker's emotional pain is so great it leaves physical marks on the skin. Meanwhile, the speaker charging, charging people to look at her skin captures the fact that the scars are not just something that the speaker can see. They are something other people can and want to see as well as they look upon the speaker who keeps trying to die and being made to live as a kind of spectacle. The speaker tries to gain some benefit from the spectacle by charging for it, but it is not clear that such an effort makes up for the speaker's suffering being on display or for a price being put on that suffering. Finally, even as the speaker's skin is something that puts her on display, it also hides the deeper truth of her pain. Take another look at the line, the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me and I a smiling woman. The return of the speaker's skin in this line doesn't indicate that she has returned to life. It also hides the deeper truth of her, 
of her pain. It tra <clears throat> excuse me. It transforms her from someone dead, from someone who wants to be dead, into what others see as a smiling woman. Even as the speaker's scars reveal her past trauma in a way that others then gawk it superficially and cruelly, it hides the deeper foundations of the speaker's pain. The speaker then ultimately seems to see her skin as a kind of prison that defines her in ways she doesn't want to be defined and as such can also be seen as a symbol for the speaker's sense of her position in society. All right, where the symbol appears in the poem, lines four through five, my skin bright as a Nazi lampshade, lines 16 through 18, soon, soon the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me. Lines 33 through 34, I may be skin and bone, Nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. Lines 57 through 58, there is a charge for the eyeing of my scars. Lines 73 through 75, ash, ash, you poke and stir, flesh, bone, there is nothing there. The next symbol is uh, the phoenix. The phoenix is a mythological creature with regenerative abilities. It is commonly depicted as a bird with red feathers and is said to burst into flame when it dies, rising back as a new life from the ashes of its old body. At the end of Lady Lazarus, the speaker warns her enemies of her upcoming resurrection, asserting that she will rise with her red hair and she'll eat men like air. Though the speaker does not explicitly mention the phoenix, it is generally understood that because of the themes of death and resurrection, as well as the mention of red hair and an earlier mention of the poem, uh, in the poem of Ash Ash, the speaker is evoking the imagery of the phoenix. As mentioned, the phoenix is already a cultural symbol of death and resurrection. However, in this poem, the speaker adopts the phoenix as a symbol of female empowerment. Throughout the poem, the speaker draws attention to a problematic gender dynamic, heavily implying that her pain is caused by the men who continue to bring her back to life. God, Lucifer, her doctor. Initially, the speaker is only ever brought back as the same woman she once was, telling the reader, nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. However, by the end of the poem, the speaker has prophesied that upon her next resurrection, she will transform into a strong mythological creature that can easily destroy her enemies, the men surrounding and controlling her. However, the phoenix symbol in the poem is complicated and can be interpreted in a variety of ways, and not all of them empowering. Because the speaker has transformed into a phoenix at the end of the poem, this could signify that the speaker is struck, stuck in a cycle of death and rebirth for much longer than the nine times she initially described. And this way, the phoenix symbol can be read as expressing even more fully the intolerability of the speaker's life. Though logically, the reader understands that the speaker is not truly immortal, the speaker demonstrates that her life is so insufferable that it feels as though her life will continue indefinitely. Another way to look at the phoenix is that because the speaker has not literally transformed into a phoenix, the phoenix could also symbolize the speaker's wishful thinking. There is little in the poem so far to suggest that the speaker can truly eat or destroy the men around her by any means making her rise in the poem as a phoenix, a sort of revenge fantasy. So while the phoenix is often used as a symbol of strength and resilience, in this poem it might be read as something that the speaker wishes she could attain, but in fact is beyond her reach. Finally, the final image of the speaker transforming into a mythological phoenix can be read as a description of what the speaker is hoping to accomplish in this very poem, Lady Lazarus. Of course, the speaker can't literally transform into a phoenix, and it seems unlikely that the speaker can literally destroy the men who have subjected her to the cycle of pain and bitter anger in which she finds herself. But the poem itself offers the speaker a way to transform her pain and anger into something more powerful and effective. The poem itself offers the speaker a way to transform into a phoenix, 
whose rebirth is a triumph rather than a recurring tragedy. And by communicating both the depths of her pain and identifying the men who are the sources of her pain, the poem does enact vengeance upon these men, both within the poem and in the broader world, and in the broader world, in which the poem now makes the subject of the world's critical gaze. Where this poem appears in the poem is line 82, Out of the Ash, and lines 83, 84, I rise with my red hair and I eat men like air. Okay, the next one is Holocaust imagery. Throughout the poem, the speaker uses various images from the Holocaust as a metaphor for her suffering and a representation of her victimhood. The controversial and potentially offensive to those who feel that the speaker's pain and experience can't possibly be equated with the wholesale and cold-blooded slaughter of millions of Jews, it is clear that the speaker uses this extreme imagery precisely because she feels that it captures the intolerable situation of her life. Early in the poem, the speaker describes her skin being as bright as a Nazi lampshade. The Nazi lampshade refers to a popular post-World War II rumor about Nazis making lampshades from the skin of murdered Jewish prisoners. The speaker implies through this image that her skin is similar to that of a Jewish person's during the Holocaust. That her skin is dead, yes, but also that her skin has been tortured, objectified, and used. Further, this description uh, positions the speaker herself as being Jewish, which strongly implies that the speaker feels that she herself endures a situation much like the Jews did under Nazi Germany, that she is being oppressed, controlled, and brutally killed by a malevolent systematic force that is bent on her destruction. The, speakers later, the speaker later explains, I turn and burn, ash, ash, which could be seen as a reference to the cre cremation often associated with the German concentration camps of the Holocaust. Following the cremation, the speaker's enemy and the reader poke and stir the ash, finding no sign of the speaker other than a cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling. Again, these specific images are meant to evoke the Holocaust crematorium. After the Jewish prisoners were killed, their valuables, often gold from jewelry and tooth fillings, were collected by the Nazis and melted down for profit. The cake of soap is a reference to the disturbing and unfortunately not inaccurate rumor that the Nazis used fat from the bodies of murdered Jewish people to create bars of soap, or could be read as a reference to the fact that the Jewish prisoners were often told that they were being brought to a communal shower, when in actuality they were being herded into gas chambers to be murdered. Again, in these allusions to the Holocaust, the speaker seeks to demonstrate the extent of her oppression by equating her own anguish and experience of oppression to that of the Jewish people, while also comparing her enemy, her own enemies, the men controlling her, to Nazis. Where the symbols appear in the poem, line 5, bright as a Nazi lampshade, lines 8 through 9, my face a featureless fine Jew linen, Line 71, I turn and burn. Line 73 through 75, ash, ash, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there is nothing there. Line 76 through 78, a cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling. All right, now we're going to talk about the speaker. The speaker of Lady Lazarus, the... <laughs> The speaker of Lady Lazarus reveals quite a lot about herself throughout the poem, because in many ways this poem is about her. The speaker reveals quickly that she is a 30-year-old woman. It can also be assumed from the context of the poem that the speaker is Lady Lazarus. This is certainly an ironic title that the speaker has given herself rather than her real name, and thereby ironically connecting her to Lazarus the man whom Jesus resurrected from the dead in the Gospel of John from the Bible. Because the speaker is a woman and identifies different male authority figures as her enemies, it can be assumed that the speaker is suffering from gender oppression, which seems likely in turn uh, to be one of the main reasons she wants to die. The speaker is also surprisingly dead. 
Though not explicitly stated, the reader can assume from the first line, I have done it again, that the speaker has killed herself. Of course, the speaker is not literally dead, although the speaker makes it very clear that she does want to die. Rather, it seems that she has once again attempted to take her own life or express the desire to do so, and that her resurrection has been the refusal of the men around her, whether father, husband, doctors, or anyone else, to actually let her die. The speaker uses death and resurrection as an extended metaphor to represent the extremity of her suffering, the lack of control that she has over her own life and death. It can also be assumed that the speaker of the poem is Sylvia Plath because many of the poem's details are directly related to the events in her life, specifically her age, gender, and the suicide attempts that are referenced. All right, the setting. The setting of this poem is unclear, with the speaker crafting a landscape of metaphor and emotion. There are no mentions of any environment, nor does the speaker ever identify a geographic location. Because the speaker is dead, at least metaphorically speaking, it could be assumed that the speaker is in some sort of limbo or purgatory, waiting for the inevitable return to her body. One could argue that the setting of the poem is the speaker's body, though this is not technically a place per se. The speaker's body is often the central point of the poem and where all the poem's action occurs. In regard to the era, it could be safely assumed that this poem takes place in 1964. The age of the speaker, along with several other, several other autobiography... De I just can't talk. It's been a long lecture. Uh, several other autobiographical... Bio bio you know what I mean. Details indicate that the speaker is Sylvia Plath. In which case, these details imply that the poem takes place at the same time it was written. At the very least, based off the multiple Holocaust references, one can assume that the poem was written not long after World War II, which ended in 1945. Alright, the literary context. Following her death by suicide in 1963, Lady Lazarus was published in Sylvia Plath's 1966 posthumous collection, Ariel. Many of Plath's well-recognized works appear in Ariel, such as Daddy, Tulips, and Ariel, the latter of which shares its name with the collection. Ariel is considered a hard turn from the much lighter, less personal poems from Plath's first collection, The Colossus, which was published in 1960, as it dives into much darker and intimate themes of mental illness and suicide. The collection also covers some similar themes as Plath's semi-autobiographical novel, The Bell Jar, which was published in 1963. Sylvia Plath was considered a poet from the school of confessionalism, which was poetry that often delved into the personal and taboo topics of the self, such as mental health and sexuality. Plath cited both Robert Lowell and Anne Sexton as being major influences on her work, as both poets often explored similar themes in their work. Plath, also inf Plath was also influenced by the work of Dylan Thomas, because Plath's estranged husband, Ted Hughes, inherited the entirety of Plath's work upon her death. He edited Ariel extensively. Hughes' influence likely permeates Plath's work in innumerable ways. Sylvia Plath's work was often divisive. Though considered a talented writer, the themes and control of content of her work often inspired criticisms that she engaged in melodrama and self-pity. Others have argued that this interpretation of her work is the result of reading the autobiographic details too closely or of refusing to recognize the actual depth and reality of both the pain Plath identified and suffered and this, ironically, of being representative of just the sort of gender-based oppression of which Plath wrote about in Ariel. All right. And that is the end of your lecture on Lady Lazarus.